I think a good place to go at this point is talk about a typical day. The way you explained it there is you typically have one meal a day and it's later in the day before bed. Let's get into specifics. How close to bed? What might be in that meal? And and let's get into the nuances here. Well, it, it depends on my my day really and how how busy I am. I when I get up in the morning, I don't need breakfast. I generally don't. And if I'm hungry, you know, I'll, I'll have something. But I I, I just listen to my body. Uh, I generally don't feel like having breakfast. I just get up, you know, take a shower, go to work, um, feel great. Don't need to stop for lunch. Just can keep going and uh, and and feel great the whole day and then I don't slow down and feel rotten towards the end of the day and like oh I have to eat something I never get, I never get hangry or or uh, you know wrecked because I, I'm not able to eat and you know then if I'm able to I'll, I'll do a workout and then come home and at that point you know might cook a big a big steak or something like that and eat until I'm full and then do whatever I need to do and then go to bed if I'm on call and it's busy and I don't have a chance to get home and get a meal, I, I may not actually get uh, to eat that night. And sometimes, you know, I might be you know, in surgery and just thinking like, man, a steak sounds really good right now. But uh, in my head, I'm like, well, this surgery is going to take five hours and I've got another one after that. And then I'm starting my day at six. And so, you know, probably not going to be able to eat until tomorrow night. And my body just goes, okay. We're not going to bug you about it because you can see my leptin. It knows that I'm not starving. It knows I have fat reserves, and so it just those that panic goes away. I don't. I don't. I don't have to eat. You know, because none of us have to eat uh, unless we're extraordinarily emaciated. No one in the West is is getting to that point unless you know they have some sort of you know severe eating disorder and anorexia or, or very impoverished. But you know, even in um, you know, we have a lot of programs and food stamps and things like that. Whereas actually, you know, people in poor economical, uh, socioeconomical um, uh, categories in the quintile, lowest quintile, actually has is o- is more overweight than other quintiles. So uh, there isn't there is uh, an abundance of energy around. So none of us are going to starve for missing one meal or even not eating for one day, um, by and large. And so because I can just see my signals my my brain knows what's going on i don't i don't get panicked i don't get worried and i just go um but normally i would eat when i get home whenever that may be if i have you know, interviews or or things like that i i probably wait until after that and then i'd have a steak and if it's right before bed i'll go to bed if it's not then i'll i'll keep working or doing whatever read and then go to bed after that but i generally when i when i'm done with my day with my work day and workout, that's when I'll have like a big steak. If I'm if I'm working out regularly, if I actually have the time to, uh, my my hunger signals will go up. My demand for energy and protein and fat will go up, and so I generally eat about twice as much. So at the moment, I eat about two pounds a day of very fatty meat, like ribeye, and that seems to be just right for me to maintain me where I'm at, which. I don't know, it seems like a little, not that all that much because I, you know, I'm six foot three, I'm 235, 40 pounds. And so, you know, uh, I, I know like smaller women that like eat more than that, you know, but it's, but they might be coming from a point where they're, they're healing and they, they, their body needs those nutrients to catch up a bit. And I've been doing this for a very long time. So I'm just sort of in a steady state, but when I'm working out a lot, I, I probably double that. I'll probably eat about four pounds a day. And so I have to eat during the day. And so I'll, you know, make a steak and cut it up into chunks and take that to work or something like that. But if I'm eating during the day, because of that lethargy that you can get directly after eating, I try to eat like not as much as I want. I just, just sort of a half meal just to take the edge off. Uh, but not enough. My body goes like, okay, well we can just, we can just take a nap and sleep for 14 hours. Now it's, you know, my brain's still going, okay, well that was fine, but that's not enough. You need to go like, you know, kill something, you know, so here's, you know, so I'll still have energy. And um, yeah, so that's a normal, normal day for me. You mentioned the energy piece, and that's where I wanted to go next. I'm curious, because this is such a unique diet. And I know you've been doing it for quite a while. So you might not recall, but how is your energy throughout the day eating this way? And do you find after you have that big meal, it sounds like what you're alluding to here, it does slow you down a bit. But talk about your energy through 24 hours and, and where you see it dip. Well, my, my energy is fantastic 
all the time. I, I don't have problems with energy. I don't drink coffee. I don't take caffeine. I don't have it. I actually feel better when I don't. You know, I'll get, you'll get a bit of a, a of a boost for a few hours if you take that. But then you have a crash afterwards, and I find that my my energy levels are horrible after that. I feel I feel gross. Almost like feel like I'm coming off of, like hungover or something like that. It's 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 not a nice feeling. And then I sleep terribly that night. It, it caffeine is much stronger <laughs> for me now. I'll take you know, maybe if I were to have. I mean, I don't know. I I don't even know the last time I've had coffee it was it was a few years ago. But the last time I did, I you know had that big spike in the morning and you know went throughout my day and then it was like two in the morning and i'm just wired and awake and just like God, i just can't wind down and i was like oh, that's stupid caffeine so I was, I was still wired uh even though i was wired but tired sort of thing uh otherwise i don't get that i, I used to be a horrible sleeper i used to have it, it was very difficult for me to get to sleep which was a really difficult thing when you're a doctor on call and like you need to you need to catch sleep in these 20 minute bursts before your pager goes off and you get called into the next thing and and it would it would take me 20 minutes to go to sleep and i just start falling asleep and then i get another call and i'm like damn it so that was that that was difficult but now i sleep very well i can get to sleep very easily and i stay asleep and i get better quality sleep so that's very good. And then if I take caffeine, obviously it, it ruins that. Um, but I find I have much better consistent energy throughout the day just normally with, with if I don't take any of that stuff. And it's it's one of those things that I, I didn't even know how much of an advantage that would be. I didn't know how much of a difference that would make until I was in it doing it. I can, you know, my, my intern year as a doctor, I was – you know, there's some weeks I was doing 105 hours a week to 120 hours a week, and uh, consistently, week after week after week after week, no no days off. You know, you'll get a weekend off and then restart. This is Monday through Sunday, and then you do it again. So you're just just going and going and going, and just working around the clock. And it was it was miserable. I absolutely hated it. It was just it was just making me uh, miserable and sick and. Uh, now I'm working similar hours, maybe even more, because now I have similar hours at the hospital. Uh, if if I'm if it, there's a lot of heavy on call, um, which is not always the to- the case, but you know it's fairly regularly we have quite heavy on call schedule, and it's generally very busy, and so we don't really get any rest, and we don't go home post call. We have to work the whole next day, so you might be working all day, then all night, then all day again, and. Most weekends I work like six days a week. I work at the hospital, but then on my if I have a day off or something like that on on the weekend, I actually have a, a, a private practice in functional medicine and metabolic health, sort of preventative medicine. And so I work seven days a week, no matter what. It's either at the hospital or it's at the hospital and the clinic. And then in the evenings, if I'm not on call and at the hospital, I'm I'm doing this sort of stuff and then trying to get get the podcasts and the videos and things like that out there. So I, I, I work pretty much every waking hour of the day and uh, with not much leisure time and um, I'm fine. You know, I feel great. Uh, my energy levels are consistent. You know, even if I don't get much sleep, I'm I'm good the next day. And that's that's a night and day difference to, I think, me throughout my entire life before this. And most people uh, around now, most people are, are chronically fatigued, chronically tired, chronically worn down. And, you know, and it's, it, it really gets to them. And I think that's a, a, a direct product of not eating the right things and not putting the right things in their body. So throughout our talk now, we're getting a pretty good idea of what your diet looks like. You talked about the timing of a typical day. We know fatty meat is is the primary, and we know the baseline is meat and water. I think before we move on, let's really hash out what carnivore is, because there's still some variability there. Are you taking any supplements? Do you put any spices or salt on the meat? Let's get really nuanced here and talk about what you're eating and what you're drinking. Yeah, so I, I don't take any supplements. I don't take any anything like that. Um, I don't think you need to. I've, I've checked all my my blood counts. All my micronutrients are all in optimal levels, it, which is different than to say they're in the reference ranges because the reference ranges are not optimal for our health. Those are the averages for the community. The first 2,000 or so people that come into a clinic every year and get these blood tests, 
That's that's the reference range because it's a reference of, of the community. That's what they're calling normal when it's the norm, but it's not necessarily normal because 90% of uh, you know Americans are have at least one metabolic issue and 70% of Americans are overweight or obese and everyone else is close behind or actually worse than that. The, you know, America is not the worst, worst one uh, by a long shot, actually. I think we're number 20 for overweight and obese uh, people um, in the world. So we're up there. But we're not we're not number one. So there are people that are worse, and and everyone else is close behind. So people are are unwell, and people, cr- you know, chronically have nutrient deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies. And this is why supplements are are such a big market now. And so when I look at blood work of of my patients and myself, I look at different reference ranges. We look at reference ranges that have been ca- calculated for. People, you know, men and women in their mid twenties who have no medical issues, and those are very different reference ranges. And so that's sort of like the ideal health. You know, that's when you're at your peak uh, in your in your health and what should be at a peak health uh, in your life. And so my my blood results and my magnesium and zinc and vitamin D and B twelve and all these things are in that range, in that range of of uh, what you would expect in a healthy. 25 year old say, and it's just eating meat. And, you know, they say, well, we don't have all the micronutrients. You don't have all these different things. Well, I do because I'm getting them and my, my blood results, uh, show exactly that and that they're in optimal ranges. You know, if you have to take supplements, then by definition, your diet is deficient, right? Um, so it can't be something that you're designed to eat. You know, koalas don't take vitamins. They don't count their macros. They just, they just eat eucalyptus leaves and they get everything that they need and so we should be able to do that as well now there's differences in you know soil health and and the nutrient content and and that and that's that's a real issue um but when people are just eating store-bought meat just you know safeway meat uh costco meat they they don't have these nutrient deficiencies uh by and large some people maybe they need to eat a bit bit of liver or something like that but most people don't most people just just eat uh, normal muscle meat. I generally just eat steaks. So like 99% of what I eat are are beef steaks. And I'll have other meats as well. I don't you know, have a problem with fish or chicken or pork or lamb, anything like that. But what I, what I feel best eating and what tastes best to me is beef. And so that's what I stick with generally. Um, I just salt, just lightly salt. I don't I use a whole bunch of salt. Uh, I don't take le- electrolytes. I don't uh, season things really. I like. I really like the taste of meat, and I and I find that people, as they get going on this, they start appreciating the taste of meat more and more, and they don't. And they want less and less spices and and seasonings. Um, and also these are these are things that can have strong flavors, and also that's you know, and that strong flavor can indicate that there's a chemical in there that your body's trying to warn you against. That strong flavor, you know, if you just you know bite into a chili pepper, it's going, oh my god. You're, you're, you have this visceral reaction saying, hey, there's something in here that maybe I shouldn't eat, that this is a bad experience. And your brain and your tongue are sophisticated machines and they can identify harmful compounds and they give you a reaction saying, this is bad, spit it out. Very bitter tasting things uh, are, are of that nature. And so I think it's, I think it's just as important, you know, it's important to eat meat and eat fatty meat. Fat's very good for you. It's very important for your health. And so we need to eat that. We need to eat a lot more of it than than people think. And that's good. That gives you your energy. That gives you your nutrients. That gives you what you need to survive. But I think it's it's just as important what not to eat as what to eat. And because there are a lot of things that we eat that can actually cause harm and, and damage to our body. This isn't a new concept. You know, we've, we've said that cholesterol causes heart disease and diabetes and things like that. It does not. It absolutely does not. Carbohydrates, alcohol, sugar, you know, seed oils probably play a role in there as well. But, you know, that concept of, you know, people that eat a lot of processed food and junk food and, and sugary cakes and all that sort of stuff, they have they have poorer health outcomes than other people. That's a concept that people generally understand. So there are things that you can eat that are harming you. And the main, the mainstay of a carnivore diet, and the reason why you you just want to eat meat is because plants defend themselves chemically. They don't have legs to run away from you. They don't have 
uh, teeth. They can't bite you. Uh, they can have thorns. They can have bristles. They can have bark and wood and things like that to protect them. But they they are static. They can't run away. They they aren't. They don't have kinetic defenses like an animal who can run away or fight back or hide or something like that. So they have to have other means of defenses. And one of the the mainstays in, in the defense in the uh, botanical world is is by using chemical agents to disrupt the physiology and and life of animals eating it. A lot of the plants are the the great chemists of the world. They make about a million different uh, chemicals most of which are used to defend themselves from animals and insects because they are the dominant life form on earth. About 99% of life on earth is, are plants. And so, you know, they have to have robust defenses because they're under constant assault by animals and insects. And so they have a lot of these chemical defenses. They can disrupt your digestion. They can block nutrient absorption. They can disrupt your hormones, make it so you, you can't reproduce. They can uh, be directly toxic and, and damage your cells, damage your respiration, damage utilization of, of oxygen. They, uh, you know, um, hemlock, North American uh, water hemlock, it's the most poisonous plant in North America. Uh, half a leaf of that can kill you by blocking the GABA receptors in your brain that don't allow your brain to sort of calm down the excitation of your neurons. So you go, you start having seizures and you can't stop having seizures and you die within minutes. So these are the ways that, that plants defend themselves. And so you, you actually want to avoid these things because they can have these chemicals in there that can harm you. And we know this intuitively. You get lost in the woods, you run out of food, you can't just eat any random plant, right? Most of them will cause harm, they cause you to get sick, and, and many will actually kill you if you eat enough of it. Um, and then, you know, obviously, there are plants that we deem edible that don't have that huge, acute, you know, life-threatening response with a few leaves, but that doesn't mean that they don't have any defense chemicals. That doesn't mean that they're completely benign. And so if you're looking for optimal health, you know, you want to avoid these things completely. So I think that it's important to not eat these things as, as much as it is important to eat enough meat. So my rule for myself is no plants, no sugar or any sweeteners, nothing artificial. And that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well, and any ingredients that would be on a packet. So really, I just just eating whole food, meat, and just drinking water. I think is the best best way to do it. So I don't I don't really go in for spices and sauces and, and anything like that. And if you just do that, you'll you'll find that your body works ex extraordinarily well, and a lot of little issues or even big issues that you didn't really realize was were. Uh, attributable to what you are eating, uh, go away. I mean, there's a number of people that are, that are finding this for autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases just melt away. Our body is reacting to different things that we're eating. We're causing an immune response and antibody response. And then, then some people who are genetically susceptible have cross reaction of those antibodies with parts of their, their own tissue and it's damaging them. And, and we've actually, it's in the medical literature, we've been treating autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, like Crohn's, like gout or, you know, gout, not autoimmune, but, you know, things like gout and ulcerative colitis. Since the 1800s, by putting people on a pure red meat and water diet, and this was this was known and, and books written about this going up until 1975 by Dr. Volklin, who wrote a book called The Stone Age Diet. He's a gastroenterologist. And, uh, and then 1977 came along, USDA said, you know, cholesterol causes heart disease, stop eating it. And we just, we just threw out a hundred years of, of medical literature, but you can still see this in the literature now, uh, for Crohn's in particular, we know that there are studies. If you put someone on elemental diet, which is just a, it's highly processed. It's like a, it's like a drink sort of thing, like a powder scoop. It's just nutrients. It's nothing else. You put someone on that and that's a better treatment for uh, acute flare-up of Crohn's, it gets them out of a flare-up of Crohn's quicker than prednisone or prednisolone, like a steroid, which is like the gold standard. This is this is the heaviest drug we have to get someone out of acute flare-up where they're having bloody diarrhea 20, 30 times a day. It's, it's horrible pain. Just not eating those things is better treatment than the best pharmacological intervention. There's another uh, study that was a controlled trial where you eliminate out uh, they eliminated out carbohydrates and fiber from the diet of Crohn's patients 
and they stayed in remission on average 51 months. So that's over four years on average. And then contrast that with control group who didn't remove carbs and, and fiber, and they stayed in remission on average zero months. So it was a big contrast. There's a big difference. And what does that suggest? It suggests that there's something in the carbs and the fiber that were precip that was precipitating this autoimmune reaction and response. And so you'll find that you have all these issues. And I know people with MS, there, there are even you know, uh, uh, reports of people with Huntington's reducing their symptoms of Huntington's, which is crazy. I thought I thought that was purely genetic, but apparently people are having improvements. Ehlers-Danlos, who is a, a connective tissue disorder, they have hypermobile joints. I have three patients right now with Ehlers-Danlos. And uh, you know, one gentleman, every morning he woke up, he had a different joint or two out of out of alignment. His shoulder would be out of socket, his knee would be out of joint, his fingers would just be crooked sideways every morning. He'd have to realign his joints, and uh, a few months into a carnivore diet, he doesn't have he hasn't had a single joint dislocation. So there's something to do with that as well. You're giving your body more collagen. You don't have to make faulty collagen. Uh, you just have the the proper building blocks there, ready available for you. And it, it seems, that, and that's why you don't even have to go full carnivore for that. Just eating a lot more meat and, and cutting out the carbs and sugar seem to help that significantly. So there, it's a it's a dramatic difference. Uh, that people can make in their lives. It's not subtle. It's, it's a huge, huge difference in benefit to people's lives. And I think a, a lot of that is A, eating enough of the right thing, but I think very importantly, eliminating all these things that can cause direct harm. Ta last example, type 2 diabetes has been shown in clinical, in large clinical uh, controlled trials to be reversible on a ketogenic diet. I mean, you eliminate carbohydrates type 2 diabetes goes away. What does that mean? That means that the carbohydrates are causing type 2 diabetes, right? So this isn't a, this isn't a disease. This is a toxicity, right? You're, you're getting chronic you know, low grade toxic exposure from something and it's, and it's degrading your body over time and you're, and you're having these sorts of medical responses. So you treat those differently. You don't treat those with pills. Maybe you treat them with pills to, to sort of help mitigate this, the symptoms, but the treatment for a toxic exposure is to remove the exposure. If you're getting lead poisoning, it's going to cause end organ damage, damage your brain, damage your other organs. And so yes, maybe you need some sort of support there or chelating agent. But the number one thing you do is you get rid of the lead exposure. And that's what we need to uh, recognize as doctors. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. No animal eats the, the variety of plants that we do. And I think that that's causing and driving uh, most of the modern non-communicable chronic diseases that we face these days. It is the complete elimination diet.